But if you put a particle that's polarizable uh, in the MS appeal of a cavity, then it induces both uh, resonance frequency shifts and also splitting of the resonances. And if you, particularly if you look at the splitting, then you have a very nice um, environmental noise insensitive way of measuring part the, the presence of, of a particle. Uh, here, uh, I'll be talking about a similar sort of thing, cavity quantum electrodynamics. Doesn't sound similar, but it turns out it is. I hope I can convince you. Uh, we were looking at interactions of a single atom with, with a resonant mode. Sorry, I, I uh, ran here <laughs> from another, another meeting. Um, so, uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about for this lecture came out of uh, work that I did and other people did uh, in Jeff Kimmel's group at Caltech, collaboration with Drew Bahala. This is a, a really spectacular picture of the St. Gabriel Mountains. Oh, this is a... The St. Gabriel Mountains, which are right beside LA, I really recommend you go there, you visit, it's really quite spectacular. Quite, quite an amazing difference between LA and, and, and these mountains. <coughs> um, so there are a whole lot of people who are involved. Um, these people are a few. There are others that I kind of must have to them. Okay. So the motivation I wanted to give you for this idea of doing cavity quantum electrodynamics was, was um, a quantum information network. This sort of network, you know, the idea is that you have you know, some nodes where you do quantum information processing. Uh, <coughs> so you do information processing of qubits rather than regular bits, and you have channels which connect the nodes. And you can, if you make this a scalable architecture, then you can, this, you can imagine that this could be a quantum computer in one location, or it could be a distributed quantum computer or a quantum communication system if you separate. You separate the uh, nodes by a long distance. <clears throat> so, uh, no one's really sure exactly what the nodes are going to be at this stage. Could be an atom, could be a neutral atom, could be superconducting qubits, um, could be indie centers, could be all sorts of things. Uh, but we can all agree that, that, at least in most circumstances, the, the best channel is optical because. Uh, fiber optics extremely low loss, light is low, de you know, so that means you have to have uh, low decoherence. Uh, light travels very fast, so you can get go long distances. Right? And this makes sense. And if you want to have a communication optically, then you've got, some, got to have some way to in interface between the optics and the atom or artificial atom that you have in your node. And um, the way you do this is by putting an optical cavity around the atom or artificial atom. Now we know from the last lecture, and we'll see again in this lecture, that, that if you've got a whole lot of different electromagnetic modes, that, that uh, a particle can, can scatter light into, then it preferentially scatters into the modes with small volume. Right? <clears throat> so what that cavity does is it makes one mode, hopefully one mode, have very, very small volume compared to all the other modes around, environmental modes, and encourages the atom to, to put its emission out into the channel that you want it to emit into. So this is, this is the idea. Um, right, so that's essentially what I said from here. So again, the important parameters are the low volume of the the cavity. We'll see, we'll see why in more detail uh, later on. If you can get a small enough volume and a large enough quantity, then you can get coherent interactions between the field inside the cavity and whatever artificial atom you put into it, whatever that might be, whether it's a single atom or quantum dot, or the mechanical vibrations of the mirror, we'll talk about that uh, in about an hour or other fields, like the building rockets you want to do, whatever. So, so what we're interested in is this coherent interaction between an artificial atom and an optical field. 
You can imagine if you had an integrated optical resonator, uh, then you can have several of them on a chip, all fiber coupled in one node, and then fiber connecting that to other nodes. So you have, a, at least in principle, a very nice scalable uh, network which you can do quantum information with. So the, the main challenges here are A, being able to realize a universal set of quantum gates that, that means um, doing all the gates we normally do in classical optics, but doing them quantum mechanically at each node, which, which requires as one part this, this controllable yeah. coherent interaction between the resonator field and the atom behind the quantum bar. Uh, and you need scalability and stability. Right. Scalability means essentially the platform, the architecture you want to have silicon chip based, probably, or at least chip based, microfabricated, fiber coupled sort of device. And you want to have a stable interaction between your atom or artificial atom and your resonator. So the atom has to be in the same position. This turns out to be a big problem for all the kinds of experiments I'm going to talk about. Alright, so here's the system. Right. We have an optical cavity, two mirrors, light inside the cavity. In this case, I've got a cesium atom in it, it doesn't matter, you can choose any, any, uh, any type of atomic system you like. Uh, it's in the field, so there's some, there's some coupling rate between the atom and the cavity mode. And I'm going to model it as just a two level atom at this stage, right? so in the ground state and the excited state. I'm going to go through basically exactly the same maths as I went through in the last lecture for a particle. Uh, to draw the analogy, I guess, between cavity QD and, and, and the sort of particle sensing. So we've got a bare energy in the system, which is just the number of photons in the cavity mode, plus the zero point energy in the cavity mode, plus the atomic excitation, plus the zero point energy in the atomic mode. The resonator and atom then interact through the electric field. The electric field uh, orientates the atomic uh, polarization dipole moment, uh, and, the, and the atomic dipole radiates into the, the cavity field. And the interaction energy is just negative P dot E, as before. <coughs> I'm going to quantize the electric field again. This time, I'm, I don't know if you're not going to remember from the lecture earlier today. Uh, there was an I in here earlier today. Um, I'm, I'm going to neglect the I. That's essentially just, uh, I'm essentially just choosing a different rotating frame. I'm rotating the phase of a rotating frame by, by, by 90 degrees. So I'm move that I. Um, uh, the reason I do that is really convenient is because it allows you to draw the analogy more strongly with, 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 with particle sensing. And again, we've got this, this uh, uh, electric. You know, the, the um, electric field strength of, 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 of the zero point uh, field inside the cavity times some, some uh, part of position. In this case, it's the atom position as opposed to the biological model, not model, sorry, molecular position. So, right. So now, just as the, the same as in the last lecture, we, we want, if we want to calculate the real part of the electric field, it's just E dagger plus E on 2, uh, which if I substitute in. This is, uh, if I substitute in 3, I just get the, the electric field strength of the quant uh, <coughs> times, times A uh, e to the I omega T1 plus A dagger to the minus I omega T. So that E to the I omega T is just due to the rotating frame. So now if I look at the, the atomic dipole moment, the atomic dipole moment is just E times the position of Electron, right? You've got at least a, if you've got a, a, an alkali atom with 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 uh, you've got your electron, you've got the nucleus, which you just model as, uh, as a as a positive charge with with charge E. The electron's got negative negative E charge, so you've just got a dipole with the separation being R. So the atomic So the atomic uh, double moment is just the R. We can play a trick to put this into a more convenient form, uh, which is to, to put identity matrices on either side of the R 
and then expand them out as, as the sum of a j of the other product of j, the sum of a k of the other product of k, uh, then I can, I can push my, my j to the other side here, and what I get is this inner product of, of j, k with r in the middle, which is <coughs> just the atomic transition matrix element between j and k, and I get the, the atomic transition operator sigma j k, which takes the only form of state from state k and puts it in state j. <coughs> so then, for a two-level atom, all I've got is j and k can be ground in the other state. So there are four terms here. There's, there's j equals k equals g, which is a ground state. Uh, j equals k equals e, the excited state, and then the two cross terms. But from symmetry, you know that these, uh, or selection was equivalent, you know that these, the uh, DGG and DEE -E are zero. <coughs> so you're left with just two terms in the, in the uh, atomic dipole. Uh, all right, which, which depend on the step up and step down operators, sigma GE and sigma EG. <coughs> which at this stage are not in a rotating frame. So what I want to do is I want to define step up and down operators uh, in the rotating frame such that such that that this GGE sigma GE is equal to this, so it's equal to, to the same thing which is rotating the frequency I omega T, but I've chosen the, the phase of this rotating frame so that, uh, so that DEG equals DGE. Uh, because one is the complex conjugate of the other. So what I've done is I've chosen the frame so that it's so somehow it's real. So then I get I get atomic dipole moment, which is just <coughs> uh, just a function of transition probability and these step up and down operators in the rotating frame. Okay, so um, if you now uh, calculate the interaction energy, this is just plugging in with my electric field and, and my dipole uh, expression for the atomic dipole moment, then you get you get four terms, right? This, uh, and, and what and what you can see is that there are two terms which which are slowly varying, and two terms in this case somehow not varying because because I've chosen the atom and the cathode to be at the same resonance frequency. Uh, and you've got two terms which are oscillating very, very fast. Just as in the, in the previous lecture, these fast oscillating terms, we say that it's so fast that nothing in the system can respond at that rate, so we can just cross them out. And we're we'll left with the interaction energy here. All right, so, if I, so now I can do the same things I did in the last lecture, and I can define the, the atom resonant coupling rate, G atom, I'm using the atom here to distinguish it from the G I used in the scattering, scattering uh, rate case for the last lecture. Uh, and then I just get this very simple expression, the interaction energy, which is just minus H bar times that G times, uh, times these products, which just shuffle the energy back and forth between the atoms, right? Um, in this case, you take one, one uh, uh, photon out of the cavity, you put it in the atom, in this case, you take got excitation out of the, out of the, the um, atom and put it in the cavity. So then we get a total Hamiltonian which looks like that. It's just the, the um, air term and this is the cavity term. And if we compare that with the Hamiltonian I had before, it's really identical. So this is this is the Hamiltonian for coupling between two counter-rocketing modes inside the Tori Julia dipole. This is the Hamiltonian uh, for coupling between an atom and a cavity. And you can see they're, they're really identical. Uh, the only difference is in the case we've got the particle, you get a frequency shift on the two BM modes due to the interaction, which you don't see in the atom resonator system. Uh, doesn't really matter. Doesn't really make a huge difference to the problem. Uh, and there's a minor difference in the form of, of coupling rates. Uh, in the atom case, the coupling rate goes as 
as inverse square root of volume, whereas in the in the in the uh, <coughs> coupling between two counterpropagating modes inside the resonator, in case it goes as one on the mode volume. So you've got you're more sensitive to mode volume uh, when it comes to scattering than you are uh, when it comes to the coding QED. And you're also more sensitive to part of the position, which you can more here. So broad, but broadly the conclusion would be the same. And so what we know from the previous lecture is that if you have that sort of this sort of Hamiltonian, what you're going to get is splitting between so instead of having two, two uh, degenerate frequency modes, you're going to get two modes which are uh, in the in the in the cavity in the two cavity mode case standing waves. In this case, superpositions of the atom being excited excited from the cavity being excited, which are split in frequency by two g. That's in fact exactly what you see. So this is so this is just a picture of. Uh, <coughs> This is transmission, if you imagine coupling a very small amount of light so that you don't saturate your atom into this atom cavity system. Without the atom, you just see the cavity resonance. With the atom, you see two split resonances split so that the splitting is 2 times g. And the strong coupling regime of cavity QD is just defined as the regime where that splitting is well resolved. So that means that, that the coupling rate is large compared to both the cavity decay rate, kappa here, sorry I used gamma in the previous slide, the previous lecture, and gamma, the atom of atomic decay rate. <coughs> so yeah, so another definition for strong coupling is that it's a regime in which the presence of a single atom significantly changes the 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 alpha of the cavity uh, when you put a photon in to probe to probe the cavity. So it changes the likelihood that that photon is going to go through the or not. <clears throat> and again, in order, to, in, in order to maximize this coupling rate, we really want to be in the strong coupling regime. That's telling us that the coherent dynamics is dominating over the, the, the dissipation, dissipative rates in the system. The dissipation, being in that regime, we want to have G large, which means we want to have a small mode. Model. That's why we look at these sort of miniature fabric pro resonators, toroids. Atomic band gap cavities, things like that, to maximize G. So if you have strong coupling, if, if, if I have a coupling rate far, far exceeding any of the dissipative rates, and I put a single photon into my cavity, then that photon is going to start cycling back and forth between the atom and the cavity and the atom and the cavity, and then back and forth at the Rabi frequency. So this is what you see to be talking about. Citation, for example. We know, we know that in a classical case, Rabi frequency is just given by this, it's given by um, <coughs> that uh, transition element, matrix element, times the electric field, divided by h bar, so if I increase the electric field magnitude, then uh, I increase the Rabi the Rabi's splitting, the Rabi frequency. The interesting thing is, even if you turn that to zero, <coughs> even when there's no driving field, Kennedy quantum electrodynamics tells you that there's going to be splitting, there's going to be some Rabi oscillations. These are called vacuum Rabi oscillations. Because, because the, the, the zero point energy of your system causes electric field fluctuations which drive the process. <coughs> so, okay, so, so in the limit that these decay rates are zero, this is a coherent process. Um, but obviously, in reality, it's not. So, this is a very nice exper early experiment. On this cutoff, 1996, uh, on coupling uh, an atom to a microwave cavity, which shows this coherent oscillation with damping off to the decay. So the other parameters that you might care about for this for the system, apart from apart from just being in the strong coupling regime, are the critical photon number and the critical atom number. The critical photon number is the number of photons you need to put into your cavity to saturate the atom. Generally, you want to avoid that. You want to have a photon number lower than that. Although, you can think of this as nonlinear optics with only one photon, right? If you, can get, if you can get the saturation photon number less than one, then that means one photon has a nonlinear behavior inside the cavity. And the critical atom number is similar in that if you have, if it's less than one, that means that one atom significantly changes field transmission. So this allows you for something like single atom switching. Of the optimal cavity response. 
So uh, we're interested in doing these sorts of experiments with microspheroids because they do provide this integrated scalable pla platform. Uh, what you imagine is that you have your toroid, it's going to have this field, you stick, you either have an atom sitting in your emissive field or you stick a quantum dot or an MB center, some sort of artificial atom, to the surface of the cavity. You couple in with, with an optical fiber, this can be very efficient, far more efficient than, than an equivalent cavity fluoro type, type scheme. And then we want to get the glycerol cup of the machine. If you look at the, at the theory of this, it looks like the, the, the toroids are very good. It's a really nice paper on the theory in 2005. Uh, so, so because microfluorides have a very small mode volume, you can get very hard, high, high cup, uh, uh, coupling rates, so greater than 500 megahertz. And because both of these, these other parameters, the saturation atom number and the critical photon number, goes, goes 1 on g squared, you can get very, very small numbers for them. So in principle, we should be able to get down to, to both of them, you know, about uh, 10 to the minus 6. Um, this, is a, this is a plot of, of G as a function of the minor diameter of the toroid. So imagine taking the toroid and squeezing the, di the minor diameter. Then as you squeeze that, the mode volume goes down and you see that the, the, the G goes pretty much asymptotically up. This is the equivalent uh, as, uh, Saturation photon number, which goes down, this is only equivalently for the, the um, saturation, the, the critical atom number. So, if we compare microtorus to other systems that are around, then this is what I'm doing here. Uh, a fabric probe resonator, you might be able to get to about 100, you know, the, the coupling rate about 100 megahertz can get to 500. Uh, although maybe the, the theory, this is what people have achieved experimentally, theoretically you might be able to do better than that. Uh, microspheres, now there was an, an experiment on chemical QD with microspheres from about 1995, uh, which, was, which was done in the chemical group. But the results were very, uh, how, do I, how do I say this, it wasn't very convincing. It worked, but, but barely. And the reason it worked barely was what I talked about. Uh, in, 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 in my previous lecture, that you've got all these degenerate uh, modes uh, <clears throat> which aren't the one you're looking at, and the atom can couple them to them equally well, equally as well as the couples of the mode that, you, that, that you're, you're looking at, that really masks the effects you care about. So I think microspheres are not a good choice for this experiment. Um, so, in order to hang out cavities, you get a huge coupling coefficient. Uh, <coughs> but you also get large dissipation, so the Q is not good. So if you look at the ratio of the coupling coefficient to the to the to the dissipation, it's it's not it's not so high. I think people know better than so that's been okay. Um, <coughs> so basically, we want to compare these or these these figures, and what you see is that the toroid we should be able to achieve or is the toroid should be able to achieve something like 100, 150 times. The coupling, the coupling rate should be 150 times the dissipative rates, <coughs> which compares very favorably to, to the, other, the other type of cavities here. The, other, the only thing that's comparable really is the microsphere, which, which uh, doesn't, isn't really effective because of this degeneracy between uh, modes at different angles. <coughs> All right. So there is one question here which doesn't most other can be QD questions. And a question I thought about quite a lot when I was at, at, at Caltech because I felt like it must give an advantage somehow to, to, to toroids. This is this, this point of having two degenerate counter-propagating modes. This is not the same as having uh, these degenerate modes at different angles because both of them always couple into my fiber, so I can see both of them, so I control them both. So the question was, is there any advantage you can gain from this? And I had a feeling there must be, but I couldn't really think of much, and then they came up with this very nice experiment I'll talk about at the end. Um, but you can see the effect by again switching to the normal mode basis, so that you're looking at, at symmetric and anti-symmetric standing waves. <laughs> the atom interacts maximally with the symmetric standing wave, and 
doesn't direct the Vienna symmetrics anyway. So what that means is the splitting in the symmetric case is enhanced by a factor of, of, of root 2. The symmetric field is enhanced by a factor of root 2. Um, and, and there's also no splitting in the, 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 the anti-symmetric setting like case. So this is, this is the basic effect. If the factor of root 2 is OK, it turns out there are problems associated with that, and I'll talk, talk about that in the next slide. You can model all of this with the full Hamiltonian. You can come up with rate equations for the, for the atom excitation of the optical fields. Fourier transform them, you get spectra for all these things, and you can look at them, and this is the sort of results you get. So it makes it, it, it does exactly what you might expect it to do. So this is this is if I scan a probe through my system, I've got an optical field, and I scan the, the frequency of that field over the resonance of the cavity, and I look at transmission past past the toroid or reflection back uh, in the direction of excitation, back the way the excitation came. And what, I, what you see is, so this is, uh, this is transmission, this is reflection, is that, no, sorry, it's the other way around. This is, this is transmission, this is reflection. Uh, what you see is that, if, so this is increasing atom cavity coupling rate. The scattering rate between the two cavity modes is this, is this space in here. And what you can kind of see here is that, is that, the, this black stuff, the, 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 when you're, okay, so what, so what you can see is there are two frequency, there are two, uh, these are the two standing waves of the cavity, and as I increase that coupling rate, one of them splits, right, with the splitting being equal to two times this g. The other one stays still, which is what, which is, which is what you expect. And what you want is, you want to be able to sit here, you sit your probe at this frequency, and have Adam come along and shift you up to here so you go from having no transmission to a large transmission. That's a good signal that you're in the strong coupling region. That's the sort of signal we were looking for. But there's obviously an issue with this that isn't present in other cavities, and that's, and that's that you have a resonance that you're not interacting with. And that's this, the atom's not interacting with. And that's this, we look here, there are, if I switched off, so, so what I've got in the case where there's no atom, so I've got a resonance of this frequency, and I've got an equivalent resonance here, split, split by, the, by the coupling rate between the two cavity modes. When the atom comes along, this resonance just stays still. The other resonance moves a lot. But what I'd like to see is this, is this trans, transmitted power drop. This is actually the wrong way around. This is the transmitted power here. I'd like to see the transmitted power jump. Uh, up. But because I've got this other mode here, uh, yeah, but because I've got this other mode here, it doesn't jump up as much as it would. It should jump up to, 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 to all the power, right? It doesn't do that because I've got this mode I'm not interacting with. So that gives you, I guess, another criterion in strong coupling. You really want scattering rate between the two, the two modes of the cavity to be large compared to this new process. And that means, <coughs> that means that these two modes are separated far out from the wings here. <coughs> um, yeah. so, so the experiments that I was involved with uh, <coughs> uh, on, on this area were basically like this. We had, we had a, a, a magneto-optic trap which had cold cesium atoms in it. We had that sitting above a toroid, we dropped, we, we released the trap, the atoms drop down and fly past the toroid, and you hope that some of them go through the optical mode of the toroid, and then I can see the effect of them on the transmission of a probe through, through a fiber which is up in the cavity. So, with no atom, you arrange the coupling into the cavity, so it's what, what's called critical coupling, so all the light goes into the cavity, some of it then backscatters through scattering mechanisms and it comes back out of that cave and you can observe that. Uh, when an atom comes along, it essentially ruins that critical coupling and makes a large portion of the light go forwards and you can detect transit. So this is what we might expect uh, if an atom comes along, you have zero transmission and then it jumps up suddenly large and then back down to zero. 
So one really nice thing about these experiments is the efficiency you can get. So in, in, uh, in a fabric grow system, it's very difficult to couple light efficiently into the, into the cavity because it's got a very small cavity mode and, and the latter a lot of choices. It's, it's coming in from free space and you just reflect off into, into modes in free space. Here, because, because we're waveguide coupling, the light only has the choice of being in the waveguide or being in the toroid, so you can get very, very high efficiency in. Uh, everything's fiber coupled, so you can get quite high efficiency uh, in the fiber all the way to protection. So uh, on my calculations at this stage, we had a total efficiency of around 40% to detection in the system. Um, but we're doing much better than that now, actually, because most of that is due to, was due to losses in the table, and now we've essentially eliminated those losses. So this was the experiment I set up. I'll talk about that once the time. Um, so you can see here's a chip with a whole range, with, with a set of toroids on it, we're coupling to one of them. We've got a magneto-optic trap, which is a bit off-center here, so you can see the toroid, but it was, should be sitting right in front of the, right on top of the toroid. Uh, and you drop the atoms past the roof of the toroid, and hopefully you see some, some transits. This is the magneto-optic trap. These are the kind of results we saw for a typical drop of, of the mark. If there weren't any atoms, then, then the, the power uh, going through the, the, to the detectors was low, there were atoms we saw peaks, which would be the atoms. And you could interpret the statistics of these peaks, I guess I won't go into this, to determine what sort of coupling rate we were getting. And the coupling rate of the peak is about 50 megahertz, which compares to the, to the loss rate here, which is dominated by the cavity of 18 megahertz, so it's definitely strong coupling, but it's not as far as a strong coupling regime as you might, you might hope for. So after, after I left Caltech to move essentially here, I guess, um, in a sort of so curious way, uh, they did this beautiful work which was, which was using the fact that you've got two cavity modes to do switching. So they call this a, a photo turn, a turnstile. Where, if so, if your atom is in the ground state, then then the light sees a critically coupled cavity, so it all goes back out the way it came. If the atom is in the excited state, the light sees uh, um, a non critically coupled cavity, so that so it goes through. So if you have the atom excited and the atom emits and you detect a click, so you know the atom's emitted, then now you know immediately afterwards the atom must be in the ground state. And that means no other light can be transmitted. It's all reflected because the light is, is critically coupled. So this is the idea of the experiments. It's, so it's single photon nonlinear optics. You're using the detection of one photon to control how other photons are routed. So the real issue with these experiments and what I believe they've been struggling with at, at Caltech uh, in the past couple of years is how do you stabilize there's no point if you're wanting to build a quantum information network dropping atoms past the mode of a cavity. It doesn't work. So, so the question is how do you have the atoms sit inside the cavity without contacting it? Because as soon as it contacts it, then, then the atom is chemically bound to the, to the cavity surface and it changes, it, it, it's not a single atom anymore. So, so one way to do this is, is to trap the atoms in a far off reson resonance off the trap. Uh, in principle, this works really nicely. The idea is that we have a blue to tune laser, which the atoms are repelled from. We have a red to tune laser, which the atoms are attracted to. The blue to tune laser has an evanescent field that decays faster because it's wavelength is small. So you've got this blue laser like this, a red laser like this, and you get a little trap in between the two. Um, but the size of the trap is very small. So, so it turns out it's very hard to put the atoms cold enough in this state. Inside, inside that trap. What I think is a better option if you want to do a real quantum information network is to attach some sort of artificial atom like a quantum bomb or an empty set of toroid, and that's stuff that we are working on, at least loosely, not, not immediately for this, the goal of doing cavity quantum electrodynamics, but the goal of uh, generating uh, single photons on demand here. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, right. So, to summarize, I'll do the time a little bit early. It's okay. So, to summarize, uh, county quantum dynamics is an important tool for quantum information networks and for understanding quantum systems in general. Um, Western Gallery mode cavities have some advantages in this area, particularly you get such you get a very nice ratio of Q to V, which allows you to get into the strong coupling regime, and you've got this integrated architecture which in principle should allow some sort of scalability. Um, they have disadvantages, the main disadvantage being that you're coupling to an evanescent field rather than the field inside the cavity. Obviously you can't couple the field inside the cavity because uh, well solid, um, and, and then if the evanescent field decays, it, it only exists within about 200 nanometers of the surface of the cavity, so you've got to get atoms very close to the cavity without having them fine. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so strong couplings have been observed in these systems, um, but we really need to improve the stability of this problem. Um, the next lecture is not on the same model for so the next lecture is on what we can are there any questions for worry? Okay, um, in that case, can I suggest that we reconvene five minutes earlier? And um, so we'll kick off the next se uh, session at uh, 10 to 5. Okay, so we've got 10 minutes or so break.